Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1150 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL will have two exhibits at this weekend's QSO Today Virtual Ham Exposition. NASA recently held a press conference offering details and the efforts to resolve the issues keeping the Eris Columbus module amateur station off the air. We will have all the details. The Dayton Hamvention Awards Committee announces this year's honorees. The Volunteer Monitoring Program has issued its report for February. We will bring it to you. A bonus station is added to the upcoming 13 Colonies special event. The 23-centimeter band in Region 1 is under discussion ahead of the World Radio Communications Conference 2023. Radio amateurs in Israel lose access to much of the microwave spectrum. And every amateur has built a dipole, but one amateur has built a really big dipole. We will tell you all about his achievement in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about four new zero-day exploits discovered in Microsoft Exchange email servers. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will be here to explain why the word of the day is software. Our own amateur radio historian Bill Continelli W2XOI returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill concludes his two-part series on the history of amateur radio full duplex relay stations, better known as repeaters. Our tower climbing and antenna master Greg Stoddard KF9MP will be here with some general antenna tower mounting tips. And Courtesy of Hap Holly, KC9RP, and the Classic Rain Report, we will have his behind-the-scenes interview with Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, the mastermind behind this weekend's QSO Today virtual ham exposition. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in what was a great spring preview in Albany, New York, where we hit almost 70 degrees, but now we're returning to the deep freeze. I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from our news bureau in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, where spring seems to be on the horizon after we've had a couple of days of 70-degree Fahrenheit weather. I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from Mud Station Zebra in New York's Catskill Mountains, where the first flowers of spring are beginning to rear their beautiful little heads, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the birds have begun to sing once again, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Thor's hammer and copious rain may be coming into play this week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story this week, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Chris? Leading off news this week, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Exposition takes place this weekend, March 13th and 14th, 2021. Thousands have already registered to participate. ARRL and QSO Today Exposition Partner will have two exhibits at the show. One will offer opportunities to meet ARRL lab engineers who will answer questions and share tips on an array of topics. ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, will deliver the Expo's keynote address at 2000 UTC on Saturday, March 13th. The Expo has a packed lineup of 87 speakers and workshops spread across 10 different virtual theaters. March 13th and 14th sessions start at 1600 UTC. 
Presentation topics will appeal to amateur radio newcomers and veterans alike. Because it's impossible to watch all of the live presentations of interest, attendees can return to the platform anytime through April 12th to see any presentations. A full day track on amateur space radio will cover beginner to advanced levels. The Expo's Youth Forum on Sunday morning will be organized by Carol Perry, WB2MGP. Advanced presentation topics will include pipeline type radio wave propagation and double inverted HF Delta skeleton slot antennas. Less experienced hams may want to watch such presentations as getting started in remote HF operating and an overview of parks on the air. Other exposition features include live kit building workshops, a tour through the virtual exhibit hall, which will be filled with popular amateur radio manufacturers and suppliers, live demonstrations of the latest gear, new video technology to provide a better experience for attendees to engage with exhibitors, virtual lounges where you can meet fellow hams via the latest video technology, and a number of exhibitors will be conducting prize drawings. Those who want to explore the virtual Ham Expo offerings in advance of the show should check out the several podcasts starting at 0200 UTC on Saturday, that's Friday, March 12th, in U.S. time zones from the Podcasting Pavilion, as well as Techno Dance Party After Hours from the Amateur Space Radio Auditorium. Visit the QSO Today Ham Expo website for more information about the Expo and tickets. There's still time to get early bird discount tickets at $10. The price of admission increases to $12.50 on March 12th. At a March 10th news conference, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station reported that, so far, all efforts to determine what's keeping the ham station in the ISS Columbus module off the air have been unsuccessful. Here is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, with more details on what was presented at the recent press conference. The radio equipment appears to be working, but no signal is reaching the external ARIS antenna. The station, typically operated as NA1SS, has not been usable since new RF cables were installed during a January 27th spacewalk. During the January spacewalk, the coax feed line installed 11 years ago was replaced with another built by the European Space Agency and Airbus. ARIS International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, did not rule out a fault in the radio equipment. What we can tell you right now is that from all indications, the radio appears to be working as expected. You know, the radio was working fine before um, the EVA on the 27th of January. Bauer listed three possible problem areas. A cable inside the cabin may have a break due to a previous tight turn. A connector may be installed improperly. Or there was a problem with the installation of a cable installed in series with the ARIS antenna feed line on January 27th. A March 13th spacewalk plans to return the ARIS antenna feed line cabling to its configuration prior to the January 27th spacewalk, so the problem may have been resolved before you hear this report. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The news conference covered details of the cable troubleshooting already conducted. Bauer said the ARIS team has been working closely with NASA and the ESA to identify what may have caused the radio anomaly keeping the ISS Columbus module ham station off the air. He thanked ARIS Russia's Sergei Sambarov, RV3DR, for allowing ARIS to use the ham station in the service module to continue its contact schedule. This past week, astronauts on the ISS performed troubleshooting tests on all four new feed lines installed on the Columbus module. One cable was earmarked for the ARIS station, while the other three are for Bartolomeo. ARIS reported over the weekend, however, that it was unable to establish communication using any of the feed line cables connected to the ARIS radio system, which was tested in APRS mode. The plan to return the ARIS cabling to its original configuration was a contingency task for a March 5th spacewalk but the astronauts ran out of time. ARIS became aware of the station problem after a contact with a school in Wyoming 
between ON4ISS on Earth and Hopkins at NA1SS had to abort when no downlink signal was heard. For the time being, Eris school and group contacts with crew members have been conducted using the ham station in the ISS service module. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Congratulations to Tamitha Mulligan-Scove, WX6SWW, better known as the Space Weather Woman, who is this year's winner of the Technical Achievement Award from the Hamvention Awards Committee. Tamitha was among those chosen for this year's honors by the Hamvention co-chairs Michael Calter, WHCI, and Frank Beeford, WS8B, who called her a real space pioneer. Most amateurs know her from her solar weather reports on the internet, as well as on Ham Nation, YouTube, the Weather and History Channels, and for her work in the MIT Technology Review and in Popular Science Magazine. Licensed since 2018, Tamitha is a research scientist for the Aerospace Corporation and has also been an instructor at Contest University numerous times. The Hamvention co-chairs wrote, she is always seeking new ways to bring an awareness of space weather and its effects into the mainstream and hopes to herald in a new era of TV weather broadcasting before the end of Solar Cycle 25. Honors are also being given to Wesley Lemboli, W3WL, who is receiving the Special Achievement Award for his work in youth coaching, membership recruiting, and technical problem assistance. Angel M. Vasquez, WP3R, is receiving the Amateur of the Year Award for his work as one of the principal support engineers at the Arecibo parabolic dish antenna that was operational in Puerto Rico until its collapse late last year. Club of the Year has been given to the Vienna Wireless Society, K4HTA, for its educational efforts and public service for 50 years in the Washington, D.C. area. If the coronavirus pandemic continues to decline, Belgium's communication regulator, BIPT, says that it will resume amateur radio exams from April the 26th. There are three license exams in Belgium, and there's no need to work up through the low-level exams. If you have the capability, you can just sit the Class A exam and get the HAREC equivalent license. Remember that HAREC stands for Harmonised Amateur Radio Examination Certificate. It's not a license in itself, but a sort of exam pass slip, which allows qualification levels to be compared across different countries and their exam systems. In Belgium, the pass mark in all the multiple choice exams is 50%. For Class A, the full Herrick license, there are 48 questions, of which 30 are theory, 10 on regulations and 8 on procedures, and the time allowed is 90 minutes. For the Class B novice license, there are 38 questions, of which 20 are theory, 10 are regulations and 8 are procedures, and the time allowed is an hour. For the Class C basic license, there are 30 questions, 12 on theory, 10 regulations and 8 on procedures, and you have one hour to complete the paper. When the exams resume, these new exam regulations will come into force. Those who want to prepare for the Class B novice exam can visit the online learning environment provided for radio amateurs by the Belgian National Society, the UBA. Here, you will also find which parts of the full Herrick manual must be known for the Class B exam. Prospective Belgian radio amateurs can register for all the exams by email. For the Class C basic exam, applicants must also possess the certificate showing that they've passed the practical test. The regulator BIPT says it will contact applicants to propose exam dates, and candidates already on the waiting list will also be contacted. If you want to find out more, go to tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Belgium. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the radio amateur service. To date, Volunteer Monitors during February reported 1,700 hours of monitoring the HF frequencies and 2,150 hours of monitoring VHF and above. The Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator issued 10 advisory notices. 
An advisory notice is an attempt to resolve rule violations issues informally before FCC intervention. Operators in Holdenville, Oklahoma, Luzerne, Michigan, Miami, Florida, and Merrick, New York, received advisories concerning operations outside their license class. Operators in Megalia, California, Jefferson, Georgia, and Redway, California, received advisories concerning interference to repeater systems and HF net operations. An operator in Mansfield, Arkansas, received an advisory regarding failure to properly identify. And an operator in Charlottesville, Virginia, received an advisory concerning improper bandwidth that resulted in interference. A desert racing association in Odessa, Texas, received a warning about the use of amateur two-way frequencies for racing events. The Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator had two meetings during February with FCC Enforcement Bureau personnel. Fans of the popular 13 Colonies special event will be happy to learn there's a new bonus station and a new design for the QSL cards. Here is some background. France, which played a key role in the American Revolution as the Continental Army's primary ally, will also provide some major assistance in this year's 13 Colonies special event. Ken Villon, KU2US, manager of the popular on-air celebration, has announced that TM13COL will be operating from France and joining the other stations as one of the bonus contacts. Ken said Didier F5 OGL asked whether he could represent France in the July event and said five other hams will also be willing to become on-air allies. They are joining the other overseas bonus station, GB13COL, which is always popular with operators in the U.S. and Europe. QSL cards are also getting a different look this year. They will feature ships, a popular image used about eight years ago, U.S. bonus station WM3PEN, operating for its 11th year, will feature the USS United States, one of the first frigates built in Philadelphia for the U.S. Navy. Each state will select a colonial ship relevant to their history. The QSL card for Massachusetts will feature the USS Boston, and the card for New York will have an image of the USS Niagara. The overseas bonus stations will feature Hermini and the HMS Victory. The event will be held from July 1st to July 7th. A certificate will also be available for successful contacts. That success comes in big numbers, too. Last year, more than 202,000 QSOs were made. In advance of the World Radio Communication Conference 2023, or WRC 23, the amateur radio allocation at 1240 to 1300 MHz, the 23 centimeter band, remains in the spotlight in the International Telecommunication Union Region 1, which is Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Chair of International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Spectrum Affairs, Barry Lewis, G4SJH, reported that preparatory work continued during the February 15th to the 19th meeting of the ITU-R Working Party 4C. Also representing the IARU was Ole Gerpestad, LA2RR, with other IARU members present with national delegations from Australia, Brazil, Canada, and the U.S. The 23-centimeter World Radio Communication Conference agenda item has initiated technical studies focusing on coexisting between the amateur service and the Galileo GPS radio navigation satellite service. The IARU participated in the meeting and delivered key information on amateur activities in this microwave band. This information is vital to ensure the amateur radio services are realistically represented in the studies as they move forward, Lewis said. It remains vital that national amateur radio communities present their views on the importance of this band to their national regulators in a consolidated and consistent manner. To assist, IARU Region 1 is developing supporting material that member societies can refer to when addressing the topic with national regulators. Work on this topic will continue throughout the year and beyond, both in ITU-R and in the regional telecommunications organizations. The summary meeting report for the Working Party 4C meeting says, the only administration that can be considered supportive toward proper treatment of the amateur services in this work is Germany. It encouraged support from outside Europe. Working Party 4C will meet again in July.
You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. Radio amateurs in Israel have lost much of their spectrum between 1 and 6 gigahertz and suffered a draconian power reduction on 10 gigahertz, according to a report earlier this year in Southgate Amateur Radio News. The report said an Israeli Ministry of Communications amateur allocations document from November 17, 2020, shows these changes between 1 GHz and 10.5 GHz. The 9 cm band, which was 3.4 to 3.475 GHz, has been lost altogether. The FCC in the U.S. announced last fall that it would be sunsetting amateur access on 3.3 to 3.5 gigahertz to accommodate burgeoning 5G wireless providers. The 23 centimeter band in Israel has been pared back to 1260 to 1270 megahertz from the former 1240 to 1300 megahertz and is only accessible by class A license holders for satellite uplinks at a maximum power of 25 watts. Satellite segments remain on 6 centimeters, 5650 to 5670 megahertz at 50 watts and 5830 to 5850 megahertz at 200 milliwatts. The maximum power level permitted on 3 centimeters, 10 to 10.45 gigahertz, is now just 100 milliwatts down from 100 watts for Class A licensees. ARRL member Bob Leo W7LR of Bozeman, Montana, turned 100 years old on February 26. He's been a ham for 88 years and is a well-known DXer and DXpeditioner. Check out his QRZ.com profile. The dates have been posted for the four Stu Perry Top Band Distance Challenge events on 160 meters, if you're into that kind of thing. This year's main stew in December will occur one week earlier than usual on December 18th to avoid a conflict with Christmas. The schedule for this year is March 13th, June 19th, October 23rd, and December 18th. The full results of the 2020 ARRL November CW sweepstakes have been published on the ARRL Contests webpage. It's contests.com. ARRL.org. The full results article, a searchable database of all scores, line scores, certificates, and log checking reports, are available there too. The Spring 2021 Red Cross Nationwide Emergency Communications Winlink Drill will take place on May 8th, which happens to be World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day. Lou Ottens, inventor of the cassette tape and a CD pioneer, died aged 94 at his home on Saturday, the Dutch media reports. Ottens, who studied to be an engineer, started work for Philips in 1952. Eight years later, he became head of the firm's recently introduced product development department. Within a year, he and his team had developed the first portable tape recorder, of which over a million were sold. Two years later, he revolutionized the old reel-to-reel -reel tape system by inventing the cassette tape. Reflecting on the invention, Ottin said, I got annoyed with the clunky, user-unfriendly reel-to-reel system. It's that simple. The new carrier had to be small enough to fit into his jacket pocket, Ottin's decided, and he had a wooden model made to determine the ideal size. In 1963, the first plastic-encased cassette tape was presented at an electronics fair carrying the slogan, Smaller Than a Pack of Cigarettes. The tapes were quickly copied by the Japanese, but in different formats. Ottins managed to make a deal with Sony to use the mechanism patented by Philips to introduce a standard cassette, which was then rolled out globally. Over 100 billion were sold worldwide. Ottins then went on to develop the CD, which again became a Sony Philips standard, and that sold over 200 billion. In 1986, Ottins retired, but he was often asked if he was proud of his inventions, which allowed millions to have access to music. I have no pride dial, Ottins said in an interview, stressing that both inventions were team efforts.
His biggest regret was that Sony, not Philips, invented what he considered to be the ideal application for the cassette tape, the Walkman. That still hurts, he said. Dubious about the recent revival of the cassette tape, Otyon said, nothing can beat the sound of a CD. Registration is now open for the 2021 HamSci Workshop, Friday and Saturday, March 19th and 20th. With more details on the upcoming workshop, we go to League Headquarters in Newington, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Registration is now open for the 2021 HamSci Workshop, Friday and Saturday, March 19th and 20th. The theme of this year's workshop is Mid-Latitude Ionospheric Science. The University of Scranton will serve as host for the Zoom virtual event sponsored by the National Science Foundation. The program will include guest speakers, poster presentations, and demonstrations. The workshop will also serve as a team meeting for the HamSci Personal Space Weather Station project, funded by an NSF grant to University of Scranton physics and electrical engineering professor Nathaniel Frisell, W2NAF. The project seeks to harness the power of an amateur radio network to better understand the effects of weather in the upper levels of Earth's atmosphere. The workshop's keynote address on the history of radio will be delivered by Elizabeth Bruton, Curator of Technology and Engineering at the Science Museum of London. She will discuss the history, science, technology, and licensing of amateur radio communities from the early 1900s to the present. See the HamSci website for information, www.hamsci.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. J. Michael Rohoniemi, a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Virginia Tech and principal investigator of the Virginia Tech Super Darn Initiative, will review the physics of the mid-latitude ionosphere and discuss ways in which the amateur radio community can contribute to advancing scientific understanding and technical capabilities. Joe Zekovich, K1YOW will present amateur radio observations and the science of mid-latitude sporadic E. The event will also include virtual oral presentations by researchers from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, MIT Haystack Observatory, the University of Oslo, the University of Bath, Case Western Reserve University, Dartmouth College, the University of Alabama, Clemson University, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and the University of Scranton, among others. University of Scranton students Veronica Romanek, KD2UHN, Kwang Nguyen, and M. Shaf Sarwar, KC3PVF, are among the iPoster presenters. Participation is free. The 2021 HamSci Workshop is supported by the National Science Foundation and the University of Scranton. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Ooh, this week, it's time for news. Microsoft announced on Tuesday, oops, we found four zero days in our email servers, Microsoft Exchange. What is a zero day? You hear this from time to time. We're talking about exploits or flaws, security. Security problems in a program or operating system are called exploits because they can be exploited by bad guys and or girls i guess there's bad guys and bad girls i don't know bad people let's put it that way bad bad humans so far it's mostly humans it could be aliens sometimes you don't know we don't know it could be martians don't think so but anyway it could be these exploits you know usually are discovered and patched or fixed patch is a way to fix them i'm giving you a lot of uh, terms here I'm trying to explain them as i go so patched means a fix Usually they're patched before they become public. That's kind of the way it's supposed to work. Security researchers are banging on software. Companies are banging on software. Usually it's not the companies that find it, ironically. 
a lot of times it's a, it's just an independent third party, but they're good guys. They, they sometimes call them white hat hackers. And uh, the 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 good human, the good people, the good <laughs> the good entities are uh, generally going to tell the company and give them at least 90 days, three months to fix it before they disclose it to the world. There is a good reason to disclose it to the world, especially if companies refuse to fix it or ignore them, because the longer uh, an exploit lives, the bigger the chance some other bad entity will find it and take advantage of it, exploit it, exploit the exploit. So you kind of want to make it public eventually so that everybody's aware of it and can do what they need to do to uh, fix it, if, especially if the company doesn't fix it. Usually companies do. So this is the traditional 90-day disclosure period where you, uh, a security firm will tell a company and fix it. Now, in, this, in a case of a zero day, and that was what happened here, a zero day means there were zero days between finding the problem and finding somebody taking advantage of it. A zero day is the worst kind of security flaw because it generally discovered because somebody is using it. In this case, four newly discovered flaws in Microsoft's Exchange server, which is their email software used by mostly by big companies, had been used by a unusually aggressive Chinese cyber espionage unit. Unusually aggressive because phew, they really went crazy. These were flaws in Exchange Server from going back to 2013 all the way up to 2019. Microsoft released emergency security patches on Tuesday to plug those holes. In uh, the three days since, security uh, experts say that this unusually aggressive Chinese cyber espionage group has stepped up operations because takes a while sometimes before people apply the fixes. Remember, I always tell you, oh, do the patch, do the patch, don't delay. This is why. Because once it's announced, once it's found, now the clock is ticking. These bad guys have only a limited amount of time to take advantage of it. So they stepped up attacks. What they did essentially is they put a, a server on the, um, on, the, uh, on the server, a server on the server, a double server that would allow them to attack this other server through the internet from a browser with administrative access. So essentially what happens if you're running exchange server, as many companies and government agencies are, the, uh, the hackers could log in over the web, have full access, download the email, see who's talking to who and all of that. Now we're learning that at least 30,000, 30,000 U.S. organizations including a small, a significant number of small businesses, towns, cities, and local governments, among whom uh, Exchange Server is very popular, have been hacked. Not are vulnerable. It's a larger number than that. 30,000 have been hacked. <sighs> I'm quoting Brian Krebs, who is a great uh, security expert. He used to be at Washington Post. He now does a blog called Krebs on Security. He quotes two cybersecurity experts who have uh, briefed U.S. national security advisors on the attack. They told Krebs, the Chinese hacking group thought to be responsible has seized control over hundreds of thousands of exchange servers worldwide, each victim. Remember, it's not just it's not an individual. These are servers, which means each victim representing an organization with hundreds or thousands of users. So millions of people may be affected by this. Good news, if you're using Gmail, if you're using, there, for most people, your email company's not using Exchange Server. If you're using your internet service provider, it's very rare. It's mostly used by businesses and governments. It's used by big organizations. The Chinese hacking crew is called Hafnium. I don't know why. Hafnium. But they've been targeting these attacks on infectious disease researchers. Why? They're looking for vaccines, right? Law firms, maybe looking for, you know, deep, dark secrets, higher education institutions, defense contractors, policy think tanks, and non-governmental organizations. <laughs> 30,000 have been hacked, at least, and hundreds of thousands affected. Microsoft says it's working closely with CISA, the U.S., 
Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. This is like the Solar Winds attack, only I would argue even worse. Solar Winds was a Russian attack. Microsoft said the best protection, what do you think? What do you guess? Is to apply updates as soon as possible across all impacted systems. If you're running Exchange Server 2013 through 2019, assume you have been compromised, according to uh, Chris Krebs. No relation to Brian Krebs. Chris Krebs, a former director of CISA. Check for eight character ASPX files in net inet pub www root ASP net underscore client system underscore web. If you get a hit, you're now in incident response mode. In other words, you've been hacked. It's fairly easy to find uh, this information. I'm you know, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll post a link to the tweet in the show notes so that um, you can uh, you can see that for yourself. If you're running Exchange Server and you're a sysadmin, who boy, who boy. What do they do? Well, you know, they're looking, it's espionage. Uh, could be industrial espionage in some cases, could be national espionage in some cases. Police departments have been hacked, credit unions, hospitals, city and state governments. If you're running self-hosted Outlook web access, <laughs> you probably got hit. Wow. Wow. It just keeps happening, doesn't it? Oh, boy. Yeah, this is an interesting attack because... And I think you could kind of say the same thing about the, the solar winds attack, which was attributed to Russia a couple of months ago. These companies are not necessarily looking to wage war, cyber warfare on us. It's more espionage, like among other companies that were targeted, pharmaceutical companies, so that the hackers could steal uh, recipes for medications, including, of course, the COVID vaccine. So that's that, it's that kind of, I guess, that kind of espionage. Even if you patched on Tuesday, the day Microsoft released its fixes, still a chance there that this software is on your server. In fact, if you're running Exchange, according to uh, Stephen Adair, president of a security company that first noticed this on January 6th, if you're running Exchange and you haven't fixed it, well, there's a very high chance you, you've been compromised. Oh, boy. Just thought I'd put out the word. You could read my email. It's nothing interesting. <laughs> not nothing. No, trust me, I don't even want to read my email. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. In our last installment, we traced the development of FM and repeaters from 1932 up to 1970. Since the FCC rules at that time had no provision for repeater operation, Stations in repeater service were operated under the Part 97 provisions covering remote control. The FCC, in February 1970, came out with docket number 18803, which set forth the Commission's proposed repeater rules. These included small subbands set aside for repeater operation, a ban on linked, cross-band, and multi-band repeaters, a requirement for whistle-on or other tone control, and a requirement that the licensee of a repeater station be in attendance at the transmitter or at an authorized fixed control point to monitor all transmissions of the station. In regards to the two meter band, the FCC set up the repeater subband in such a way that two thirds of it would not be accessible to technicians. Reaction was quick and negative. The ARRL and others felt that the proposed rules were so restrictive that they might be the end of amateur repeater operation as it existed at that time. Counter proposals, far less restrictive than the FCC's, were submitted to the Commission. While amateurs waited for the revised FCC rules, another problem had to be solved. When 2 meter FM operations started in the 1960s, 146.94 had been chosen as the national simplex frequency. This was the highest wideband FM frequency available to technicians. 
After repeaters came along, amateurs discovered that the surplus commercial equipment in use had a maximum bandwidth of 600 kilohertz. Thus, 146.34 was chosen for the first repeater input. However, in areas where 9.4 was in heavy use by simplex stations, 146.76 was chosen as the output. This led to the problem of non-standard splits, and in some areas of the country, repeaters such as 3476, 2894, and 3482 could be found. The frequency 146.94 was a battleground between the simplex versus repeater groups. Amateurs were also fighting a minor battle over 146.64 MHz, which in some parts of the country was a DX simplex frequency. To make matters worse, all transceivers back then were crystal controlled. With crystals at $10 per pair, it would cost $120, or about $350 in today's money, to fill all 12 channels in a 2 meter radio. It was possible to equip your radio with the repeaters and simplex frequency used in one area, then find all of your channels were useless 200 miles away. A national plan was needed. The Texas VHF FM Society proposed such a plan, which was described in the May 1972 issue of QST. In it, the repeater offset was standardized at 600 kilohertz. 146.94 and 146.64 became repeater outputs. 146.4 through 146.58 became simplex and 146.52 was chosen as the national simplex frequency. In the 146 through 147 range, accessible to technicians and above, there were 13 repeater and 7 simplex channels. The 147 through 148 range, available only to generals and above, had 14 repeater and 6 simplex channels. Note that in the Texas plan, all repeater inputs were 600 kilohertz below the output, even in the 147 through 148 range. Except for changing the inputs to the high side above 147 megahertz, the Texas plan was adopted. The gradual acceptance of a 2 meter band plan still did not resolve the FCC issue. The Texas plan, as good as it was, violated the FCC's 1970 proposal. The Commission still had not issued any repeater rules, nor had they acted on the ARRL's 1969 request to give technicians the full 2 meter band. Finally, in September 1972, the FCC issued new rules covering repeaters, logging, and portable mobile operations. Liberal repeater subbands were authorized at 52 through 54, 146 through 148, 222 through 225, and 442 through 450 megahertz. Logging requirements, especially for repeater and mobile stations, was simplified. Repeater operators no longer needed a tape recorder hooked up to their stations. The requirement for a portable or mobile station to notify the FCC of operation in a particular radio district was also reduced. No longer would amateurs contemplating a cross-country trip with their radios have to write to each district on their journey in order to inform the engineer of the trip. Repeaters would have to be licensed. Call signs beginning with the prefix WR would be issued. The repeater license application was complex. Each applicant for a repeater license had to submit certain data to the FCC regarding the technical, operational, and effective radiated power of the proposed station. Whistle on or tone control was no longer required. Two repeaters could be linked, but multi-linked or cross-band repeaters were prohibited. Repeater monitoring and control requirements were made more flexible. And finally, the FCC acted in part on the ARRL's 1969 proposal. Although they did not give technicians full 2 meter privileges, they did grant them the 147 through 148 segment. Technicians could now operate on all 2 meter repeaters without violating FCC rules. The new FCC repeater rules, coupled with the Texas plan, caused a surge in 2 meter FM activity. It also was the shot in the arm the hobby needed to fully recover from the decrease in growth caused by incentive licensing. Manufacturers such as Drake, 
Standard, Regency, Tempo, Genève, Clegg, and Midland poured rigs onto the amateur market. Heathkit had the very successful HW202, followed by the even more popular HW2036. The increase of the number of technicians on 2 meter FM finally killed the technicians are experimenters, not communicators theory. And finally, thanks to 2 meter FM, amateur radio grew by over 33% in the 1970s. In 1975, due to increased demand, the FCC authorized the use of 144.5 through 145.5 megahertz for repeater operation. Technicians were given access to this subband. In 1978, the FCC relaxed the rules, eliminated the separate repeater license and the WR prefix, and gave technicians the full 2 meter band. From 1978 through 1981, the synthesized revolution took place as affordable PLL and microprocessor rigs drove the last of the crystal controlled radios off the market. Today, a name brand 2 meter HT cost about 175. With it, you can access over 4,000 repeaters or scan the VHF high band. Compare that to 1972 when a crystal controlled radio equipped with 12 channels cost about $300 or about $800 in today's dollars. We truly have come a long way. In our next installment, we will look at a couple of license proposals in the mid 1970s and the controversy they caused. I hope you will join me. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Saturday, March 13th, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that although solar activity continues to remain low, in recent days, as a sunspot rotates to the west off the visible solar disk, a new one emerged in the east. Sunspot Group 8207 recently moved over the sun's western horizon, but on March 9th, a new sunspot group, number 2808, moved across the eastern horizon. And a newer group, number 2809, has now emerged just south of the center of the solar disk. This brought the daily sunspot number higher, from 11 on Wednesday to 23 on Thursday, March 11th. Recent sunspot activity and solar flux still seems soft when compared to activity toward the end of 2020, however. In recent propagation bulletins covering November 19th to December 9th last year, the average sunspot numbers were 27.9, 57.6, and 28.9, while average daily solar flux was 90.1, 108.1, and 91.9. For the past three weeks, the overall average daily sunspot numbers was 19. We had two weeks prior with no sunspots, and average daily solar flux was 77.1. We can't do anything but wait and watch, although we can look forward to the vernal equinox on Saturday, March 20th. Like the autumnal equinox, this is always a positive influence on HF propagation when the northern and southern hemispheres are bathed in approximately equal amounts of solar radiation. You can count on it. The average daily sunspot number this week hardly changed from 18.9 last week to 18.4, Average daily solar flux shifted marginally higher from 76.7 to 78.9. Solar wind has slackened, so average daily planetary A indices went from 14.7 to 7.6, and the middle latitude numbers changed from 10.4 to 6.1. The predicted solar flux for the next 15 days is 78 on March 13th through the 19th. 75, 76, 78, and 81 on March 20th through the 23rd, 80 on March 24th and 25th, 78 and 76 on March 26th and 27th, 75 on March 28th all the way to April 1st, and 78 on April 2nd and 3rd. The predicted planetary A and DICE is 12, 20, and 10 on March 12th through the 14th, 5 on March 15th through the 17th, 12 on March 18th through the 19th, 20, 18, 12, and 8 on March 20th through the 23rd, 5 on March 24th through the 27th, 25, 20, 20, and 10 
on March 28th through the 31st, 5, 15, and 8 on April 1st through the 3rd. Time now for the AMSAT report. If you have worked the XW2D satellite before, you might know that it went silent for some reason. Well, this week it came back to life and is once again operational. There's no telling if this is temporary or permanent, so enjoy the satellite while it's still working. Aris school contacts have continued through the pandemic. If the ISS is over your area when a school contact is being made, you can listen in on the astronauts' downlink on 145.8 MHz FM. Of course, the uplink is only available to the school making the contact. Keep in mind that the location of the school is not necessarily within the footprint of the ISS, which could be on the other side of the globe. AMSAT UK reports that a test of UVSQ SAT's FM transponder was made on March 5th between Michel F4DEY and Peter 2M0SQL. This means the satellite is closer to commissioning for amateur use. The AMSAT report comes to us every week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Newcomers to Morse code, also known as CW, continuous wave, often have difficulty finding stations to work at slow speeds. To address that problem, there's a small group of dedicated radio amateurs who regularly help beginners to take that giant leap and use CW on the air for the first time. They have a Facebook page, Slow CW UK, and invite members from all parts of the world to join them. For those interested in taking their first steps into what might be referred to as the dark art of CW communication, have a listen around 3.555 MHz plus or minus QRM most evenings from around 1930 to 2030 UTC. The group have specific activity nights on Wednesday and Saturday evenings, but one or two of them can be found around those frequencies most evenings, often calling CW slow. These amateurs take some of the fear out of using Morse code on air for the first few times. So, if you feel you can copy CW at around 10 words per minute or more, then answer their CQ calls or arrange a sked. Most of them are retired, so daytime skeds can be arranged as well as evening ones. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station reports that efforts to determine what's keeping the ham station in the ISS Columbus module off the air have been unsuccessful so far. The radio equipment works, but no signal appears to be reaching the external Aris antenna. The station, typically operated as NA1SS, has not been usable since the new RF cables were installed during a January 27th spacewalk extravehicular activity. To support the commissioning of the Bartolomeo payload hosting platform installed last spring. During the January EVA, the coax feed line installed 11 years ago was replaced with another built by the European Space Agency and Airbus. Airbus has scheduled a March 10th news conference to discuss efforts to restore operational compatibility to the Columbus Module Ham Station. The news conference will provide insights into some of the cable troubleshooting already conducted. During a March 13th spacewalks, astronauts Mike Hopkins, KE5FGL, and Victor Glover, KI5BKC, plan to return the Aris antenna feed line cabling to its configuration prior to the January 27th spacewalk. Aris International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, said the Aris team has been working closely with NASA and the ESA to identify what may have caused the radio anomaly, keeping the ISS Columbus module ham station off the air. This past week, astronauts on the ISS performed troubleshooting tests on all four new feed lines installed. One cable was earmarked for the Aris station, while the other three were for the Bartolomeo system. However, it was reported over the weekend it was unable to establish communications using any of the feed lines connected to the system, which was tested in automatic packet reporting system mode. The plan to return Aris cabling to its original configuration was a contingency test for March 5th, but the astronauts ran out of time. On March 5th, astronauts Kate Rubens, KG5FYJ, and Soichi Noguchi, KD5TVP, worked on some other Bartolomeo cables and connectors troubleshooting. If all goes well, the March 13th spacewalk will complete that work. 
Harris became aware of the station problem after contact with a school in Wyoming between ON4ISS on Earth and Hopkins at NA1SS and had to abort when no downlink signal was heard. For the time being, Aris School and group contacts with crew members have been conducted using the ham station in the ISS service module. The 10th anniversary of Maritime Radio Day will take place from 1200 UTC on April 14th to 2200 UTC on April 15th. The annual event commemorates nearly 90 years of wireless service for seafarers. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners are welcome and should register in advance by April 1st, 2021. Stations such as coastal radio stations and ships may participate only if operated by former commercial or Navy operators or by radio technicians who worked on the installation and or maintenance of naval equipment. Former merchant marine radio operators or former ship's electronic technicians are encouraged to participate. All traffic must occur around the following international naval frequencies on amateur radio bands 1.824 kHz. 3.520 kHz, 7.020 kHz, 10.118 kHz, 14.052 kHz, 21.052 kHz, and 28.052 kHz. The primary working frequency is 14.052 kHz. There is no power limit. Participants exchange QSA, QRK, name, call sign of last or favorite ship or aircraft or maintenance company, and additionally, a TR message and or a QTC, if you like. Submit an email or letter detailing station's work to Ralph Marsher, Narzissenbeg, 10, 53359, Rheinbach, Germany. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. With most ham fest canceled due to the pandemic, some radio amateurs in Raleigh, North Carolina have come up with a way to adapt with a tailgate ham fest in an unused shopping center parking area. The event grew out of the so-called Ham Radio Taco Thursdays, begun many years ago by AWRL Life member Ellen Pittigoff. AB4OZ. Pitagoff had to put his event on hold when the pandemic erupted. It was suggested that hams could gather and socialize at a safe distance by having a Taco Thursday with Taco Truck outside in an adjacent empty parking lot. That event was a success, with participants remaining at their vehicles and bringing their own chairs. That success inspired holding a tailgate ham fest in the same spot, and it's now turned into a monthly event called the AB4OZ Ham Fest. Pitagoff said Taco Thursday started collecting more people, up to 15 or so, at Taco Thursday. And when Taco Bell closed due to the pandemic, the event moved to a Thursday on the air net with one requirement, that participants could not talk about COVID-19. The Tailgate Ham Fest was established at the new location and held once a month on Saturday at 10 a.m. I think this is a great uplifting and positive experience for all of us hams to get out and socialize and participate, Charles Murray said, KI4DCR. We might not be able to have a big ham fest, but these micro tailgate ham fests might be the future for a good while. I've met a lot of good people. There's a lot of cool stuff out here. The weather's great, you know. There's plenty of space for everybody to be socially distanced. I think it's fantastic. The team from the Hellenic Amateur Radio Association of Australia that's planning a November 3rd to 13th de-expedition to Willis Island, VK9HR, has expanded by one, and the de-expedition planning is on schedule. A vessel to take the team to Willis Island has been chartered to leave Australia on November 3rd, returning on November 13th. Willis ranks number 38 on Club Log's DXCC Most Wanted list. The group announced earlier that it had put off plans to include a stint from Mellish Reef last activated in 2017. The ham radio team will be just in time to celebrate the centennial of the island's meteorological facility. With time away from jobs a consideration for the operators, Mellish is being put off to 2022 
said Team Leader John Chalkiarakis, VK3YP. While the call sign VK9HR is expected to be renewed in August, Chalkiarakis is trying to get VK9W. VK9IR will be an additional call sign to be allocated, he said. VK9IR and VK9HR were used for Hellenic Amateur Radio Association of Australia's 2011 de-expedition to Lord Howe Island. Team members for this fall's de-expedition will hail from Australia and New Zealand. They're in the process of obtaining permit from Parks Australia, which is required to camp at these Australian Coral Sea Marine Parks. Chalky Arrakis said the most important document is the landing permit, also from Parks Australia. No permit is required to visit these Coral Sea Islands for non-commercial purposes, but a permit application is needed to set up a campsite and to stay overnight on the island. The now eight operator team plans to use verticals on 160, 80, 40, and 30 meters, while vertical dipole arrays will be used on 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. Operation on 6 meters is under consideration. Activity is expected on SSB, CW, and FT8 on 160 through 10 meters. The equipment complement is expected to be Kenwood TS590S and ICOM IC7300 transceivers with amplifiers on all. A de-expedition website and logo are in the works. Home to a meteorological station, Willis Island is in the Coral Sea off the northeast coast of Australia. Chalky Arrakis also said that he and some friends have been trying to obtain a landing permit for Macquarie Island VK0M, which is number 12 on Club Log's DXCC Most Wanted list, but he conceded that it's nearly impossible to get permission from the Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife Service because Macquarie is a protected nature reserve. UK regulator Ofcom has published simplified guidance on its new electromagnetic fields radio license condition. Ofcom is proposing to apply this measurement and record keeping condition to spectrum license holders using equipment that can transmit at power levels higher than 10 watts EIRP or 6.1 watts ERP. Ofcom has published detailed guidance on how licensees can ensure they comply with the new license condition, as well as an updated version of their EMF calculator, which helps licensees assess their compliance. Very recently, Ofcom have also published additional guidance for Spectrum licensees, including simplified guidance for all Spectrum users, additional guidance for maritime radio users, and additional guidance specifically for amateur radio users. So, this update includes tailored guidance for specific radio users, designed to help them comply with the new license condition. The update also includes instructions on how to use the Ofcom EMF calculator. The guidance is currently in draft form and Ofcom welcomes feedback on these documents by the 16th of April 2021. Members of the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group in Adelaide, Australia are celebrating the much-anticipated launch of Horus 55, a high-altitude balloon set aloft on the morning of March 7th with a digital amateur radio TV transmitter as its payload. As the balloon soared skyward after a brief launch delay due to rain, it relayed its TV signal to YouTube in a live stream that was broadcast worldwide. The transmitter payload, which was the main experiment, required extensive testing before launch day, especially with regard to its tolerance for low temperatures. It utilized a Raspberry Pi 0W, which captured and compressed video for the modulation of a 445 MHz DVBS transmission generated by a Lime SDR Mini. Team members Mark VK5QL, Matt VK5ZM, Pete VK5KX, and Grant VK5GR shared the triumph of the project. According to the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group website, 
The challenges included devising a transmitter system that could provide sufficient signal and still withstand the thin atmosphere at high altitudes. There was also the small detail of getting the signal from the high-performance receive system uploaded to the Internet. Shortly into the one-hour flight, signal reports arrived from receiving stations from around the region, including Ian VK5ZD near Kapunda and Joe VK5EI in Adelaide. Horus 55 also carried an experimental low ra one tracking payload transmitting position data into TTN, the Things Network, which has receiver stations across Australia. It too was a success, according to the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group website. Built by Liam VK5LJG, its performance exceeded expectations. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society report that one of the roles of the International Amateur Radio Union is the monitoring of our bands for unauthorised users. The IARU monitoring system in Region 1, which covers Europe, was set up in 1972 and has a coordinator in many countries. And we're very grateful to Michael, Echo India 3 Golf Yankee Bravo, who carries out this role for us in Ireland. Michael monitors the bands and sends a monthly report to the Region 1 coordinator, who processes all of the information submitted. These reports can be viewed on the IARU Region 1 website. The primary objective of the IARU monitoring system is the search, classification, identification and initiation of steps leading to the removal from amateur bands of radio signals of non-amateur stations causing harmful interference to the amateur services, contrary to International Telecommunications Union and national radio regulations. Typical intruders include broadcasters, over-the-horizon radars, illegal operators on various bands including taxi cabs and fishermen, military modes and many more types of unwanted signals. In his report for February, as well as the usual suspects, Michael detailed the following about a church radio. A church in the west of Ireland produced a lot of harmonics, ranging from 28390 to 28470 kilohertz and on several other frequencies due to a fault in their transmitter setup. The interference lasted from the 1st to the 8th of the month. The parish priest was made aware of the situation and advised to rectify the problems. The parish radio went silent for a couple of days and returned later without causing any more interference, broadcasting only on its own frequency. That problem seems to have been solved. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. Have you ever dreamed of attending a ham fest without leaving your ham shack? Stop dreaming. March 13th and 14th are the dates for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. The idea came to QSO Today podcast producer Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, just before the COVID-19 pandemic made a shamble of international ham fest calendars a year ago. Eric was recently interviewed by Hap Holly, KC9RP. What happens usually in May is oftentimes the Dayton Hamvention that I'd like to go to coincides with the holiday of Shavuot. And so if, if Shavuot comes on the same weekend, then I don't go. Last year, I said, oh, you know, this is great. The May is wide open. I can go to the Dayton Hamvention. And I knew that the year before, so I'd already made hotel reservations near the four days in May because I like that program as well. So then it's about this time last year, and I'm getting ready to book my flight. And all of a sudden, the, the pandemic starts. With the pandemic means that the flights are starting to get canceled or the events are starting to get canceled. So I'm kind of watching, and I'm about to make my airline reservations, and Dayton gets canceled. And so I figure, okay, let's see if there's a trend here. And so I start to see that Friedrichshafen is going to get canceled. Then if you look at this convention schedule, you'll see that ham radio operators have something every single weekend in America. There's either a ham fest or there's some kind of tailgate party or there's some kind of national convention. You know, with 50 states, you have state conventions too, plus you have all of the other conventions. The ham radio calendar in America is loaded every week. So well, I'm starting to see everything starting to get canceled. I, I'm thinking, I want to do something. I have the time. So I said, why don't we see if we could do a virtual convention? And about that same time, my wife was starting to have to do work with her students on Zoom. So I started looking at virtual convention platforms. I'd never seen any of those before. And I started to see, oh, there's six, seven, eight companies that do this. 
And so I tried to contact them, and they're so busy that none of them reply. Finally, I found one that we used last year, and they said, if you want us to reply, you have to write contract in the subject line. So I wrote contract in the subject line, I send it, and finally I get an audience with the CEO of this company, and this is how we end up using VFairs last time. We made a commitment and we said, okay, we made this commitment. Now let's just get the thing rolling. So that's kind of how it evolved. We didn't know what we were doing. We figured, okay, we understand business and we understand how to get a team together. And so that's what we did. We got a team together. We used children of friends in the neighborhood. I, I've gotten some great people from using upwork.com where we found a couple amazing people that met our qualifications and still work with us. That's kind of how it all happened. It kind of like snowballed out of control. What is a platform? To do a virtual convention, we're doing it on a technology. So let's say, for example, Zoom. To have a weekend on Zoom, Zoom is a service that's sitting probably on Amazon servers. I call that a platform. So Zoom is a platform that allows people to offer a service like presentations to people and they log into that system in order to be able to take those presentations. So our convention platform is very similar, meaning that it is a huge conglomeration of software that's designed to provide a user experience to get to content, to talk to people. That's why I call it a platform. So we're using two service providers to make the convention. We're using VFairs, which is giving us the outside lobby, the inside lobby, the exhibition floor, things that make it look like a convention. And we're using another company called AirMeet. That's a relatively new company. And they're providing us with that lounge experience and 10 simultaneous theaters so that we can do 10 presentations at the same time throughout the expo. And then we're integrating them with software so that the user experience is that it feels like it's one place. They've gone to one convention center and it's all together. So let's say it's a lot of software and when you're dealing with thousands of people, it's a lot of hardware that's in the Amazon AWS cloud that has to expand to be able to handle the sheer number of users. And then all of the content that they're downloading is also then cached, hopefully locally to them so that there's no problem with it streaming to them. It's a huge federation of servers and software and all kinds of other stuff to be able to deliver a virtual convention. So we know that 60% of the people that came to the expo last time don't go to major conventions. They don't go to Dayton, they don't go to Orlando, they don't go to Huntsville. 40% of our audience that came don't go to anything. They don't go to state conventions, they don't go to ham fests. They essentially stay home, but they're very active. So the majority of the people that came to the convention are licensed at least 10 years. They're very active on the air. They have ham stations, they buy ham Year. So that's one of the things we learned. But I learned some other stuff too. I learned that a virtual environment, if you're an exhibitor, is a really hard thing. If you're not used to it, you don't understand it. You don't have a workflow that makes it easy for you to speak to your prospective customers and then follow up. So that's what's interesting to me is that, okay, how do we make this a good experience for the attendee that's coming that wants to see great presentations and interact with exhibitors? And how do we make this good for exhibitors? One of the things we discovered last time was you could communicate with the exhibitors using text, and if they wanted to, they could push a button and open it up as a video chat, like we're doing now on Jitsi, for example. But most of the time, they didn't do that, so they didn't open the video. They were just doing text chat. And for some people, text chat is difficult because you're doing multiple conversations at the same time trying to answer the questions. Now, the thing about the expo is we had some exhibitors that had over 20,000 booth visits. That's a lot of text chat. So first of all, that could be difficult for people. But secondly, it's chat like they're doing on Facebook or WhatsApp. How do we make it so that it actually feels like a convention? And so after all of the August stuff that I was doing, mostly around the um, contest that was on the platform, I started looking at other platforms for conventions where I could, one, feel that there were a lot of people there. We had a total of 16,000 people on the platform in August. How do you feel the energy of that 16,000? And then how do you have conversations with people in either little groups or one-on-one -on -one so that you kind of have that experience of running into people? We came away with finding out that we could use a different 
platform. And what we've done in this expo is we've actually combined that new platform with the old platform. So there's this eye candy of the outside lobby, the inside lobby, but then there's this whole interactive experience around tables and chairs so that people can come to an exhibitor lounge. They can come into the Flex Radio Lounge, for example. Flex Radio is a platinum sponsor this time. And they can go to a table where someone's sitting from Flex Radio. When they click on the chair, it opens up as a video conference, kind of like a breakout room in Zoom. So people can come to a chair, they can leave a chair, they can go, go to one table, they can go to another table. So essentially, the idea is to create face-to-face -face meetings between attendees and exhibitors and between attendees and attendees. So that's kind of what I've gained from this. It's not a perfect environment. It can be a difficult environment if you're not used to it. It requires a lot of training. And then my job putting on this show is to always iterate to make it better each time because you know, we're going to make mistakes in this one and we're going to figure out what we did. And then the next one, we're going to hopefully figure out how to make that even better. Those are the lessons that I'm learning. You have 81 presentations scheduled. That in itself, having to be sure that everyone has the right audio, the right video, that's a lot of work all by itself. It is on the one hand. On the other hand, the hams are very clever people. They're not afraid to venture into areas that are new. So all of the people that are making presentations at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, they're pioneers usually in their own right, and that's why they're talking at the expo. But also, they're not afraid to try something new. And so we kind of gave them some guidelines once they accepted the invitation to speak, and we said, look, this is an electronic forum. I always give the example of going to Dayton, and I'm going into a presentation, and I sit down right in the middle of the room, and I'm sitting there, and then the presentation starts, and I know that I'm now in the wrong presentation. It's not moving fast enough for me. It's not interesting, but I'm stuck in my chair. I can't get up because it would look like I was being disrespectful to get up and walk out in the middle of someone's presentation. You're listening to an audio interview with Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, the man behind the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, which will take place March 13th and 14th. We'll learn more about Eric's upcoming Ham Expo after you identify your station. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. So I'm going to sit there in an electronic auditorium. If I don't like what's happening, I can take my mouse and click and go someplace else. And I can do that without creating a ruckus, without telling people, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and getting up and leaving. So what we told the presenters is that one of the things you have to do, and there, there's a whole bunch of industry studies on this in terms of what presentations in a virtual platform should be. I said, you need to talk like TED. The TED formula is 18 minutes and that you need to start with a personal story and you need to drive a single point home. Now, I'm hoping that most of the presenters did this. Some of the presenters will go in the traditional lots of slides with a lot of writing. But what we want to do is inspire people at this expo, inspire them to push the download button on your content so that they'll want to kind of take the next step to learn about the subject themselves. So their job really is just to kind of introduce and inspire people towards the thing that they're doing because you can't get it all in a one hour total presentation and i think that most of them have risen to the occasion and that these presentations will be great but to have a great presentation you have to start with great people i think that we have 81 great presentations and people behind them if you don't get in on the presentation when it starts there's actually going to be a 30-day window where you can go back to that forum and look at it and listen to it you bring two th things up here, Hap. The first thing is, is that we discovered that people would arrive to a presentation and they will have missed the first couple of minutes. So the way that we solved it in this one is, is, is that every presentation has a three-minute countdown video. So essentially, it's the slide of the presentation, so you know you're in the right place. And then there's a three-minute clock counting down with some music in the background so that people know that they're in the right place and that they have a minute or two to get settled before the presentation starts. That's the first thing that we learned because while we were getting emails from people saying, hey, I missed the first part of the presentation. But the second thing is, is that we have so much content. We have an amateur space radio track that has 10 presentations in it for the entire Saturday. So if you want to follow that track, well, you're going to miss all the other stuff. 
So the great thing is, is because it's available for 30 days that you can go back in and pick out the presentations that you wanted to give but couldn't get to, and you can still watch those. And invariably, all of those presentations will at some point migrate their way to YouTube where they'll be available even after. Last time with the VFairs platform that we used for the convention actually had a contest, a game on it. It was part of the platform. So we actually paid for the software that goes on top of the platform. It was called the leaderboard. And the last time, I think we had like 134 prizes available from the platform. This time, we're not doing a game on the platform. This time, the prizes are going to be part of the booth. So you actually, you're going to have to go to an exhibitor lounge and you're going to actually have to engage with them and they'll tell you how to enter their contest. There, So there are prizes on the platform, but those prizes are in the individual exhibitor booths themselves. And there's no contest for me to deal with. I'll be dealing with other issues, but that won't be one of them. There are prizes on the platform. They're just not part of the expo system itself. I know you've done some work on making the expo more accessible for your blind listeners. Tell me a little bit about how that came about. That's a good question, Hap. I actually grew up with a blind ham in California. So I'm sensitive to the needs of blind people from that growing up. And it seems to me that even if it's a small group on the platform, I don't know how many that is. It could be less than 100. The amazing thing about amateur radio is, is that amateur radio is a great hobby for blind and vision impaired people. It was important to me when it was pointed out to me about a month or two before the last expo that I should have some accessibility Frankly, I'd forgotten about it, and I was reminded gently that I should do something like that. And so last time, I realized that the platform we were using wasn't going to be friendly. I actually had a group of blind hams that volunteered to actually audit the platforms that we were using to tell me what the holes were. We weren't able to patch those up before the last expo. So what I did was I built a page that was kind of hidden on our website that had all of the presentations that were in a straight column that could be easily downloaded and listened to. The blind hams actually had access to the entire program even before the expo started. So in that vein, we made a demand with the vendors that we're working for that the systems we use are blind friendly. Now, the new Airmeet platform that we're using, it's a new company and they're trying to make it better. But I hired a programmer who's helping me to integrate all the platforms together. If you buy a ticket, all the information that's on the shopping cart will automatically populate all the platforms so that you won't have to enter the system and keep providing us with information. We already have all the information. And so our intent is is to send all of the ticket holders a magic link. And that magic link is unique to them, a universal passport. It'll take them to all of the places on the platform without them having to figure it out. And based on that, if we have any problems with blind access to the platform, then there will be another site that'll be part of this platform of this universal passport that will allow blind hams to get access to as many of the resources that we can provide. And then once we finish with this expo, we'll figure out what we're missing and then we'll iterate again and we'll try to make it even better. Where will I go? What will I need to do to take advantage of the accessibility features? It may be a question that we'll send out. It may be in a survey. We still have to send out the magic link, but maybe we should be asking you if you need some handicap access. Accessibility. And if we know that on your magic link, then we'll just make sure that you actually go to areas in our system that are designed for blind and visually impaired rather than having all of the eye candy for sighted people in terms of what the presentations, how they're listed and how they're displayed, give you a simple listing with the links that get you there with your JAWS screen reader that would be more difficult in an environment that has just a lot more pictures and stuff. If I know about you, either in advance or when you get there, because I am going to ask you the question, then we'll, we'll just make sure that you're going to the same place, but we give you different tools to get there. For all of us that were locked down with our kids or without our kids or without our grandchildren or whatever, and that is, is, is that I think all of us are kind of looking at our lives and saying, you know, before the pandemic, I could spend four hours a day in my car going to and from work and when I got home, my kids were asleep. And when I left in the morning, my kids were maybe just getting up. And that my time in my life 
is important. And so therefore, if I want to go to a convention, even to work, I think that we're going to find after the pandemic that many people will choose to work at home a few days a week before they go into the office or that many offices will say, we don't need all this real estate that we're renting because we've actually learned that a number of people can actually work from home. So I think the world has changed. And I think from that standpoint, the way that the event industry is looking at the world is, is that we will go back to having live conventions, but there will be an adjunct on live conventions that will have a virtual component. And what they've discovered, at least as the way the industry is looking at it, is, is that a virtual convention can get six times the number of participants than a live convention. And so if you add the virtual component onto the live component, then it's very possible that you actually can extend that convention to more people than you would normally. So I think that's what's going to happen. Maybe at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo may even have a live component. Maybe we'll rent a hotel or a convention center and then run it in parallel with an online convention so that people can be either live in person or online. So that's kind of how we're looking at the future, that the world has changed and that virtual conventions are here to stay. And that concludes our excerpt from Hap Holly, KC9RP's February 25th interview with podcaster Eric Guth for Z1UG, the mastermind behind the March 13th and 14th, 2021 QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. Go check out QSOTodayHamExpo.com to register $10, look and listen to what's in store for the international ham world that weekend and the month following. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartMedia, and Spotify. Foundations of Amateur Radio Every community has its own language. As a member of that community, you learn the words, their meaning, and their appropriate use. For example, the combination of words, single, side, band, have a specific meaning inside amateur radio. Outside of radio, those same words are random words with no relationship. Sometimes a term like FM can be heard across many communities with similar understanding, though not identical. It gets tricky when a word is used widely but doesn't have a common understanding at all. A word like software, for example. A question you might hear in amateur radio is, can I buy a software-defined radio or SDR that has digital modes built in? It's a perfectly reasonable question. The radio runs software, the digital modes are software, so the answer is obvious, right? What about, can the hundred or more computers in my car play solitaire? Aside from the perhaps unexpected fact that your car has computers on board, you most likely know the answer to that. No, since the computers are specialised for different tasks. And if you're driving a Tesla right now, yes, you can play solitaire, but I'd recommend that you keep your eyes on the road instead. My point is that not all software is created equal. The software inside an SDR is essentially doing signal processing, often by several components, each running software, transforming an antenna signal into something that can be used somewhere else, likely sound. The applications WSJTX and FLDigi, both software, use a computer running Linux, macOS or Windows software to decode and encode digital modes while providing a way for you to interact with it software running on software. You might well argue that we should be running applications like that directly on our radio, and on the face of it that sounds perfectly reasonable. Except that to achieve that, you'd also need to build a system to install and update different types of applications. So you could run SSTV, APRS, RITI, PSK31, FT8 or any of the other hundreds of digital modes, and new ones as they're developed. If you did that, you'd also have to provide a way to manage the operating system, to connect to the internet and provide security. You'd need to develop a user interface, perhaps a keyboard and mouse solution, a screen, etc. Before long, you'll have developed a whole computing infrastructure, much like the one we already have in the form of the computer on your desk, or the phone in your pocket. Computers are getting faster and faster every day. This allows for the software on them to become more and more complex. The interdependencies are increasing by the second, but that doesn't mean that specialization isn't useful. A software-defined radio likely has a field programmable gate array, an FPGA, on board that is great at processing data in streams. It too runs software. Your microwave is running software, as is your television, your smartwatch, your battery charger, the gearbox in your car, and your electric toothbrush. 
Making a distinction between the various types of software is helpful to understand what is possible and what is not. Being a computer nerd, I must point out that I have only barely scratched the surface of software here. In case you're curious, microcode, firmware, hardware abstraction, the rabbit hole goes very deep. Not all software is created equal and every now and then it's a good idea to remember that when you talk about a word in one community, it might mean a completely different thing in another, and sometimes the distinction is significant. As for having an SDR that runs Whisper, no. You can transmit from a computer though, but that's a whole other thing. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel usually built from a three quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across maybe a quarter inch thick material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop you will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower legs and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building if you do not have access to a welder have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe with about a, a foot between the straps which would be centered on the three foot pipe this will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna pre-drill the holes for u-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs then also do the same for the u-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube this mount should be set across one entire face of the tower, so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower if done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. 
Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to 5 inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Have you passed your amateur license exams during lockdown? Would you like to learn some useful practical skills to help you make the most of your license? Whether you're a new foundation, intermediate or full license holder, the RSGB has created a series of six videos that introduce you to some of the most common amateur radio construction skills that you'll need. You could construct a simple ballon, tune a dipole using a nano VNA, or create an audio interface between your transceiver and your computer to allow you to send and receive data modes. Whatever type of practical skill you'd like to try, there's something here to inspire you. The videos get more detailed throughout the series, with a growing level of skill required. A big thank you to Dominic, M0 Bravo Lima Foxtrot, Rob, M0 Victor Foxtrot Charlie, Nick, 2E0 Foxtrot Golf Quebec, and RSGB Exams and Syllabus Review Group member Greg, M0 Oscar Delta Zulu, who helped to create these videos as part of the Society's continuing Get on the Air to Care campaign and to link in with British Science Week. Thanks also to Henry James, M7 Hotel Juliet Romeo, Lee, Mike 7, Mike Uniform Tango, Jenny, M6 Juliet Uniform Tango, and Dave, M7 Whiskey Uniform Tango, who volunteered to learn the skills via remote teaching during the current lockdown. You can see the trailer and the six full videos on the RSGB YouTube channel, or go to the RSGB website, rsgb.org forward slash practical hyphen skills. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. After eight years of waiting, a new amateur radio decree has finally been published in the French government official journal. The most significant change is to the way amateur radio exams are marked. France only has one amateur radio exam, which is the equivalent of the International Herrick Standard, equivalent to all three UK exams combined. The French Herrick exam comprises 40 questions to be completed in 45 minutes. 15 minutes are allowed for the 20 rules and regulations questions and 30 minutes for the 20 technical theory questions. In the past, the marking was unusual. Three points were given for each correct answer, but one point was deducted for each wrong answer. France is now adopting the system used in the UK and around the world of one point for a correct answer and zero points for a wrong answer. To pass, a candidate will need to get 50% or more of the questions correct in both the rules and regs and technical theory parts. Digital Signal Processing, DSP, is being added to the exam. The exam change is expected to be implemented three months after the publication in the journal. Also announced in the decree, there are some changes relating to call signs. Here's the listing of up-and-coming ARRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network, which is a members-only benefit, to register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. The Art and Science of Operating Ultraportable, presented by Mike Molina, KN6 EZE. Ultraportable operation, or being able to carry your radio over distances, for instance in a backpack, is quickly growing in popularity, whether for SOTA, POTA, backcountry survival, or just spending time in nature. Learning how to operate ultraportable is a fun and rewarding experience. In this presentation, Mike, KN6, EZE will cover the basics of ultra-portable operating for both the new and experienced ham radio operator. This webinar is scheduled to launch on Tuesday, April 6th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's 0 UTC on Friday, April 7th. Finding and Fixing Radio Frequency Interference, presented by Paul Cianciolo, W1VLF. 
RFI, or radio frequency interference, has been a problem for ham radio operators and shortwave listeners since the radio hobby began. Interference can come from both natural sources and man-made sources. Things have changed in the last 20 years with the advent of widespread solar power, LED lighting, grow lights, digital computing devices, and so on. Learn all about finding and fixing RFI in today's world. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Check the ARRL Learning Network webpage for the latest updates. According to the Southgate Amateur News, there's big changes in amateur radio testing in France. The government's official journal has released an outline of the changes, of which are eight years in the making. France's radio exam contains 40 questions with a total time limit of 45 minutes, combining technical theory with rules and regulations. The material in France's only level of amateur radio license is compatible with the CEPT HAREC full license requirements, and a recent addition to the syllabus are questions on digital signal processing. Candidates need to get at least half the questions correct in both the technical theory segment and the rules and regulations segment before they can obtain a pass. The changes do not take effect for another three months. In the Netherlands, radio exams are returning for the first time since the November of last year. The Radio Exams Foundation is permitting the test to go forward. News reports say there's a backlog of about 200 candidates waiting. Meanwhile, in the UK, university students and young school children aren't the only ones learning new schools remotely. AMs at all levels of license in the UK are being introduced to common amateur radio construction basics through a new video series from the Radio Society of Great Britain. The videos are part of the Society's Get on the Air to Care campaign to highlight amateur radio's abilities to reduce social isolation. They're being released in conjunction with the British Science Week, which spotlights the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. This year's annual event began on the 5th of March and runs through the 14th. The videos, which are increasingly ambitious as the series goes forward, demonstrates the ways to tune a dipole, how to build a simple ballon, as well as a more ambitious project, creating an audio interface between the transceiver and computer to permit operation of a popular data mode. The RSGB has also announced a record number of hams passing their foundation license taken remotely during the past year. In a message shared on Twitter, the RSGB said 3,000 people have passed the exam since April of last year. The society compared to that of the previous average of only 1,300 people a year. To see the videos, as we mentioned earlier, visit the RSGB's channel on YouTube or its website. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, a California nonprofit foundation that supports technical innovation, is encouraging individuals and organizations with projects involving digital communication and amateur radio to apply for grants. Executive Director Rosie Wolf, KJ7RYV, said philanthropic grants are given to schools, universities, public charities, and others involved in nonprofit endeavors who submit a request. The subject areas may also include internet technologies and the communication sciences. Past recipients have included the Foundation for Amateur Radio, the Chippewa Valley Amateur Radio Club, the ARRL Foundation, and the Hoopa Valley Tribe. For more details, visit the website ampr.org. And now, with our final story this week, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this great story from League Headquarters in Newington. Ever wanted to put up a big dipole? I mean, a, a really big dipole? Well, Gary Watson, ZL3SV in Nelson, New Zealand, has installed a spectacular all-band dipole with each leg extending 320 meters. That's about 1,050 feet. The antenna is multiple wavelengths on HF, and on 20 meters, Watson says, it has a gain of more than 16 dB. It hears quite well, too. A huge 12 to 1 ballon resembling a utility pole step-down transformer converts the impedance from 50 ohms unbalanced to 600 ohms balanced. The wire he uses for each leg is aluminum-wrapped power line cable, and he uses power line fittings because they're designed to handle that kind of wire. 
The line has a 60-ton braking strength. Watson said he made the 600-ohm ladder line himself, and he uses the antenna on all bands, typically running 200 watts. Watson says he can copy stations with a monster antenna that remain undetectable with a half-wave dipole. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.